These are the promises I stand on. When the battle comes, when the temptation comes, my Bible says that we are able to withstand. Why? Because God has given us the way. He's given us, through His Word, He's given us a doorway. <laughs> There are so many subjects that I need to teach on out of this book. They're not just, you know, little homilies or little... So there's so many subjects that I feel I have the need to look into. And I've said there's no way that any pastor, even if you started when you were just a child, you could not get to all the subjects. You could get the overall gist, but the details of certain subjects I don't think one can cover in a lifetime, certainly not exhaust. Um, but one of them that I have been thinking about for weeks and weeks and weeks is on the subject which I have taught many times before. It seems like I'll teach on this subject and then go away from it for months and then by the time I need to come back, the way I know I need to come back is by certain things that I see happening around me. Can I, I don't think I could say this enough to anyone who is listening to me in the sound of my voice. There is a battle for your soul. Whether or not you think there is a battle is a different story. But any person who comes to God, anyone, the day that your eyes were opened in that day, a battle started, almost like a tug of war. You know, we read in Jude about how the archangel and the devil wrestled over the body of Moses. We read that, and it's easy for us to, if we would even try to imagine, because we know that Moses died not having entered the promised land, but, you know, the missing component is in that is that we know that he appears on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's seen by Peter, who says, look, it's Moses and Elijah in the presence of Christ. So the wrestling over the body can be understood in a multiplicity of ways, but I'd like, I'd like for us to kind of understand it this way. That is the lot of every single person in the sound of my voice, including me. It's very easy for a Christian, we're, I'm not talking about non-believers now, but for a Christian, to get complacent. It's very easy to be mistaught and to, be, uh, to get that book completely wrong because the starting point typically for most people coming into the church is God's going to solve all your problems. God's going to pave every road, make it smooth. You'll never have to worry about another thing. The sad part is that there's a paradox. The paradox is that God will do and has promised, but he's not said, I will take away every problem. He did not say that I will take away every potential for tribulation or trouble. He did not say any of that. He just basically said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. And that not being tribulation, the great tribulation of end times, but tribulation that belongs to the world. And unfortunately, we live in it. So there are a couple of components to what I want to speak about today that have to do with spiritual warfare. But they also have to do with commitment, and they have to do with the reality that I, as your pastor, deal with on a regular basis. You know, people think of the church, and they think of, uh, I don't know, maybe people think it's fun and games. You know, it's all this happy stuff. But as a pastor, I deal with people who, on different levels, some people are, we'll call them walking targets for the devil on a regular ongoing basis. They are their own worst enemy. I can give you the litany. But as much as we are all different, we all become the same. And these certain things that I see on a regular basis from different individuals that make me think today is the day I need to talk about this. Spiritual warfare, the battle for your soul, and the concept of commitment. Now, you know, commitment, that, that word scares a lot of people. When they hear that, 
you know, let's go secular for a minute. When you hear about commitment to husband and wife, you know, they're about to be married, and it's a lifelong commitment. And that's where people always go wrong. Because instead of looking at their partner, their future partner, as a component of their life, of their complete life with God, they kind of isolate, which I could say more on that, but the, the subject today is not marriage counseling, it's commitment. And as in a marriage, if, if one person is truly committed, but the other is not, eventually you've got an uneven load, you've got uneven standards, you've got one person who's going to certainly be dragging along, carrying the relationship. And the same thing happens with God, believe it or not. Although with God, he knows our weaknesses. He knows when we have tapped into that strange concept of leaning heavily on the flesh versus leaning on him. And when it comes to commitment, this is where most people go off the cliff. If you want to open your Bibles to 2 Samuel in the 23rd chapter, these are the men that follow David no matter what. Now, I'm not talking about blind dedication. I'm not talking about being stupid or foolishness, but I am talking about these particular men, beginning at verse 8. It says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat chief among the captains, the same was Adino, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. After him was El Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoahite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, the men of Israel were gone away. He arose, smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, his hand clave unto the sword. His, he, he could not, even when the battle was over, could not, they could not get his hand off the hilt of the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. I'll mention three here. After him was Shammah, the son of Eji, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground, defended it, slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. What makes these men special or different? What separates these from other people in the Bible put in a similar circumstance that would not? All you got to do is go and read Psalm 78 or Psalm 106 that talks about Israel's rebellion, the children of Israel in the desert, and they would not. What makes these men that committed? And again, I'm not talking about blind um, some blind, just random, oh, we'll just follow anybody. They knew that David was appointed and eventually, obviously, becomes king. Uh, they also knew David wasn't perfect. So what makes these men versus other men? And I'm going to tell you there's something very interesting because if you look at some of the other people in the Bible, everybody has an opportunity. Let's take somebody like Jonah. Jonah's given a commission to go somewhere, and instead he goes the other way, and conveniently there's a vessel to take him in the opposite direction. That is most people, and most people do not attribute the fact that the, the ease of which you can get out of something, the ease of which you can quit a commitment, the ease of which you can skirt doing your part is so easy, you would never think that that is a design or a method, or a way of the devil. You'd never think that in a million years. Because if something looks like it's going in the right direction, it must be going in the right direction. Right? Wrong. So I look at these men and I think to myself, did they, was it that they possessed great bodily strength? Was that it? Did they possess great wealth? Was that it? No, 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 no. The commitment, and I believe they followed David as a man of God and as a warrior, but there was a greater thing, I believe, that led these men, which is, if you want to put it this way, they were following the spirit of the spirit of God that was upon David. 
That's what they were following. They weren't, you know, we, we, we have this thing we do. We get very locked in to people. And suddenly our whole world becomes locked into following that individual. And we almost become automatons or sycophants to follow that individual unless that individual says, don't look at me. Don't do as I do. I've made lots of mistakes. But if you're going to do one thing, as I've said to you before, follow me as I follow Christ. Find, if you can't do it with me, you find somebody else that you can follow who's not telling you that you got to change the way you dress or you got to change the makeup you're wearing or you got to do this or do that. You begin by faithing and taking God at his word. And remember this one thing. Now, I'm not saying that these men were immune from the buffeting of the devil, because they weren't. But translate all of this into the now. And what we can say is many times, and I've taught out of Ephesians 6, which is where I'm going to take you, many times I think we start out with a very valiant mindset. Today, if it's something you're battling against, you say, today... I will be victorious and fill in the blanks of what it is. I've got to tell you something. That's wonderful to have that mindset that speaks faith, that says, today I will. But just as sure as you said, today I will, there was someone else listening when you said it, not before, that figures out when, listen, the devil doesn't know everything. The devil doesn't know your thoughts. So, but the moment you open your mouth, it's made known. That will be the day that probably you may think in your mind you started a great victory, but probably will end up in defeat for one reason, if not careful, and that is failure to understand the enemy is always there. Never goes away, maybe a little bit further for a season, but never goes away. And just as there's a heavenly host that watches and looks on, there's also that what we call principalities and powers in the air that we cannot see. Just like the invisible host, we cannot see. Invisible powers around us, we cannot see. So somebody opens their mouth and says, today I will. You better be sure of one thing. You have on the whole armor of God because that, that mouth just invited a whole garrison on the wrong side to be looking for the opening in your I will today, which probably will guarantee that you won't. And if you think what I'm talking about is rhetoric, believe me, if you've ever tried, if you've ever gotten up and said, today I will read my Bible more, I will pray more today, I will be on my knees at bedtime. And by the time you have uttered that, let's just say about today, I'll read my Bible today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Bible today. Or, how about you say it yesterday? Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and read the Bible. How many have done that and you wake up and you either wake up late, you wake up tired, you wake up with an eye infection, you wake up and you have no eyes, your eyes were stolen by your cat in the night, I don't know, it's whatever excuse you want to make, but it doesn't happen. Does that ever happen to you? Now, you can say, oh, well, that was just me misusing my time. Or you can look at it in a more spiritual way, which is the minute I open my mouth. I can tell you it's happened to me more times than I care to share, where I've said, we are going to do this for the church. Something that I'm, I'm really thinking is going to work out great. It'll be big. It'll be encouraging. It'll help people. The minute I open my mouth, I invited a host against me. So that's why I tell you I do things and I tell you about them afterwards. Because I already know about the enemy, right? But before I get into the, we'll call it the helps, let me just tell you what these men did have. So we, let me just catalog here. Adino, he kills 800 men with one go. You've got um, Eleazar, who basically, while everybody's running back and forth, he basically puts a ruin on the enemy. They're pretty much all the same, but they all do it in a very interesting way. They all basically overcome incredible odds. For one, it's the number of people that this um, Adino 
it says he killed 800 people essentially at one time. How does one man take on 800? In the flesh? No. In the spirit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with God, you know, something that I'm talking about here or that Hollywood has made into movies, you go, no way. But with God, it's possible. They all overcame incredible odds in the face of exhaustion, in the face of the enemy, in the face of impossibility. The next time I hear somebody say, I just can't, I just want to can. <laughs> and if you're listening on radio, it doesn't matter what I just did. I think I just gave someone the boot. It really bothers me. Where is the spirit that says, with God, all things are possible? Where is the spirit of commitment that says, let it be me, even though I volunteered for this job, and there are no volunteers here, but even though I say, let it be me, maybe my assignment is to be chief toilet scrubber. If I'm doing it for the Lord, I'm doing it for the Lord. doesn't matter what I get to do. That's the other thing. We want positions where we can be seen. We used to have one person here used to come and he'd say, you know, he'd meet somebody, he'd say, what's your, uh, what's your position? What's your official title here? He'd ask people that. What's your title here? What's your position here? You know, I wish that some of the people would have answered. I'm, I'm chief toilet cleaner. I'm chief janitor. I could use some other choice words, but it's a PG-14 moment here. Uh, so, I mean, when it comes to the things of God, the first thing is the mindset that anything that you are able to do, that's for the kingdom. And it doesn't matter if you think, I taught on this out of the Nehemiah series, what you think might be small and insignificant will never be small and insignificant in God's eyes. It's like the person that says, well, I, I, I can only give a dollar because I, that's all I have. If that's truly all you have, you're like the widow in the Bible who gave out of what she had. She didn't give out of her abundance. She gave, she gave out of what she herself needed. A lot of times people don't, because they don't understand the people of God in the Bible, we're made to look like lunatics. Why would you give your last dollar, especially to the church? Or why would you commit 10 hours to do something that you're not even getting paid for? In my, say, 20 plus years, of being here. I've seen more people come and go, and I put the number at very, very high, that think that somehow their commitment to fill a post, uh, an air shift operator, someone who's answering the phone, a security guard, they have made it as though that was such a big sacrifice, which to me, somebody like me, and I say this with, we'll call it the truest heart that I can in making this declaration, that if you think 10 hours of doing whatever for the ministry, for God's sake, is a lot, you have a skewed vision and understanding of what Jesus Christ did for you. And it's not personal to you, obviously, because he didn't die for you. He must have died for everybody else, which means you're still going to rationalize your little whatever it is you're doing. And that's what I'm telling you something. That is another way the devil works his way in to eliminate people out of the kingdom. How many times have you heard, if you've been here for any amount of time, people that came and they wanted credit for something? Or the people that come, and they won't come to do any commitment unless it's during a time when I'm in the building. That, you know, it could happen that way. It could be that I'm here. I've, I've been known to come and go from this building at all hours of the day. If I see you or I don't see you, that's not the criteria. The criteria is that God sees you at all times. So think of how pharisaical and hypocritical, hypocritical that becomes, but also think about how the devil may use that. I've seen this too. Well, she doesn't give me any credit for all the things that I do. I'm not being appreciated, so I'm just, you know, this is ridiculous. I should be getting thank you letters for my service. Tell that to every single Christian man or woman who has not just served as a pastor or a minister or a missionary on a foreign field or someone who was doing uh, food kitchens or whatever it is, you'd be hard pressed then to try and put the little piddling things that we try to 
make grievances about versus someone who dedicates their whole entire life. That's their whole life, to go and be a missionary in a foreign land. And we sit here in our ease, and I shouldn't say it like that, but understand the spirit of what I'm saying, complaining about the pastor. The devil will use that opening. And that's one thing, if you, don't, if you don't like me and you don't like what I'm saying, that's your prerogative. We all have the right to have an opinion. What I'm talking about, when you talk about biblical teachings and understanding that there are a lot of people out there, even ministers, Christian ministers, who open the door to the devil to their ministry by virtue of, all you got to do is turn on the TV. It's greed. For some, it's greed. For some, it's fame. They want to make a name for themselves. They want the world. They want to be a household name. I'd rather Jesus Christ be a household name. I don't want people to know me. I want people to know Jesus Christ. I don't walk around saying, look at me, look at how great. But if there's someone to point to, I'm telling you something. The devil will use any of these and has. I'm trying to give you today some encouragement by lifting out these three men and telling you what they did they didn't do because they, they had big muscles or they had big pocketbooks or they had great armies behind them. What they did, they did in the power of God, in their committedness, in the most impossible circumstances. The naysayers out there will say, you believe this stuff? And I'd say, heck yeah, absolutely. Do you want to know why? See, I know what God can do. Thirty years ago, if I met you on the street up there and we were talking, I wouldn't know anything about God except for the few things that I picked up along the way, which were all errors. And thirty years ago, if you said to me, you're going to preach and encourage people in the Word of God, I'd say, you're nuts because I don't even know the Word of God. See, God can take from any place. From, it's, look at it this way. It's his quarry. He can chisel out what he wants, and he can make what he wants, as long as, unlike the marble example, unless we refuse to be malleable in his hands and yield to his plan and decide our way is better, which most of us start out that way, by the way, but to be focused that there is a possibility, and it's a danger. I watched somebody who has probably 30 years in this ministry, basically piss away, and I'm using that because it's just the most apropos thing to say, their commitment, their years of service, because the devil made sure their ego and their personal preferences and their personal issues took precedence. See, this is the thing. Don't open your mouth and say, I'll do something if it's disingenuous with God. You can do it with man all you want, and you, you know, if it's disingenuous or not, I don't know, that's for the other person to know, but don't do it with God. God knows when the mouth is moving and the heart is not there. There's a, a, a chapter upon chapter in this book that talks just about that. Their lips are moving, but their heart is far from me. Now, you know, my message today maybe is not the one where you'd say, yeah, uh, you're making me feel like, uh, I want to go and do something. Maybe, maybe what I'm saying would make you want to go in the opposite direction. But what I want you to know is much like the men who are recorded here, and I'm sure that there are many more that are not recorded, of the men that, that were with David, and that chapter continues with more, but I'm sure there were more not recorded, that only God knows about, that we'll never know about, that are just like people in my presence today, we may not know their names, they may not receive grand, glorious applause, but God knows who they are. And in the day when you start dropping your guard and getting some festering mindset that says, I'm not appreciated, nothing I do is getting the recognition, all the flesh talk that you want, I want you to remember that all the people in God's book, names that are recorded that we can look to and names that are not, that we don't even know. Remember John said, if we could record everything that Jesus did and said, there wouldn't be enough pages to contain. So I'm saying to you, try and take the mindset today, especially for those people who are 
uh, committed or making commitments or desiring to make commitments to do something. There's nothing worse, by the way, than watching, and there's always this rule of 80-20, it's usually 20% of the people carrying the load while 80% sit back and talk about doing something. That's how most churches are, by the way. The number may vary a bit, but that's, that's pretty much the number. It's, it's a small percentage of people who will be passionately carrying the load for the other people that just, they don't, they don't care, they don't want to, they don't have time, they've got all the excuses, but they'll have time for other things. Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to make people feel guilty or bad. There are some people that they just, they can't commit. They'll never be able to commit. That's something you need to work out with God. That's not a, a problem that I put on you and say, you need to work that out. That's between you and the Lord. What I'm more concerned about is how the devil seizes on those lost opportunities and has a, a fantastic way of magnifying them. Like the man that uh, used to be on staff, and I won't say what type of a vocation he did for this ministry, but he was on staff and not needed for several months at a clip and until he was needed. And then when he was needed, he'd go nuts. And we couldn't use him. And for the inner staff people that are here, you know who I'm talking about. It's something that we see often in ministry. And then there's this last thing, and then I'll really get to the message. There's this last thing. When people say, well, you know, I, I don't believe in the devil, or I'm no match for the They'll find any excuse to not deal with the reality of what being a Christian is. If Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was not exempt, what does it say of Jesus? Immediately after he was baptized, was led away in the Spirit or by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by who? By your next door neighbor? By your ex-wife? By the devil? So if it happened to him, I've said to you it's a template. And look when it happened. The temptation of Christ happened immediately after he was baptized. We who understand what that means, it means it is the public declaration. It is the public testimony. Nothing else but to say what is already in that individual's heart. And of course, Jesus is a different situation. Nevertheless, it happened right after that. What a way to make a mockery of God than to take that which has been dedicated in his eyes and try and dirty it up a bit. We baptized people up in Northern California. I've told you the story. I wish my message before I baptized was the message I just spoke on about Jesus being tempted straight after he was baptized. Why? Because people get baptized. They come out of the water. They've got the most beautiful demeanor about them, usually happy and uncontrollable laughter. And you just see it. You, I mean, when you see it, most of you were at those services. When you see it, it's, it's a joy that is contagious. It's, it kind of, it just makes its way into the rest of the people that are watching. And you see people that are not, they're not thinking in that moment, the devil's right around the corner. They're thinking, oh, praise God, I love you. This is so great. I feel great. It's like a high until wham. And then suddenly you're like, what, what was that? Well, you should have been expecting it. I wish that was my message when I baptized people. But now I'm telling you, we're here. Now my message is for those people who can hear, there is a fight that we must fight. Every single Christian must fight. Now, there are people listening to me today that will say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Christians are supposed to be at peace. Christians are loving. Christians are, and they will tell you everything that Christians do, but I'm telling you something. And the thing that has, if, if there was a, a handbook to this book to be written, it would be caution to believers. Don't be so glib to think that you're not a target. Don't think that you're so unimportant or that you're so important. The people who think they're so important, God makes sure to say, you see my heel? Gotcha. You know, you'll, you, you will be reduced down to the size that God desires to reduce you down to. And to the people who take the position of being humble, they are humble in spirit, 
God knows how to lift them up. These are the things that we should exercise caution about. So how do we do it? How do we protect ourselves? And how do we really not make this some uh, caricatured, again, all these can be turned into the imagination that takes over scripture that completely warps the intent of the writer. So I will try and take a stab at a very familiar passage with you all of what we need to be looking at, which is Ephesians 6 in the New Testament, if you'll turn there with me. Now, it is probably preeminently the passage we have used here for spiritual warfare. The unfortunate thing is I can tell when I need to repeat, because I start watching people essentially do the opposite of what the Bible says. Now, you've just turned to Ephesians 6. Uh, we can certainly say there are many places I could have picked in the Old Testament. Uh, Zechariah 4, 6 is one of them, not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. I could choose many different places, but this one seems to be the place that people have somewhere to lock into. Now, Ephesians 6 from verse 10 all the way to verse 17 is what we call the armor of God. And we say, as the Bible says, put on the full armor of God. The problem is if we begin to caricature what this really means. So while you're, don't, I don't want you to turn away from Ephesians. I want you to read something that will make this verse or the verses we're looking at a little bit easier to understand if you take them from this position. So, uh, we're reading Ephesians 6. I'm going to read Ephesians 6, and then I'll read a secondary passage that kind of connects. So Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in the heavenlies or high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, to take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it goes on, but I'm only looking at these few verses. If we want to really make a, an application and stay away for a minute to the tendencies we have to make this into real clothing, if you will, let me read something to you. Uh, please don't turn there because it's only one verse, but Romans 13, 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Think of the armor in this one way first and foremost. The armor is Christ. The armor is not the outside of you. It's giving you the concepts to fortify you in the inside. If you notice when you read this, there's no covering for your back. I wish more Christians would read this. It means cowardice is not in the equation and being scared and turning your back on the enemy or on God. This is why God made no provision for your back. He's supposed to have your back. I've encountered, by the way, so many people within the body of Christ, which I would label as deserters, cowards, people who are so afraid of what I'm not sure, probably of their own shadow too. We should be inspired, greatly inspired by what if you want to just take the Apostle Paul, but we don't have that. We've got many different voices, but the Apostle Paul saying, this is what the Lord will do to help us. He didn't just say, okay, come on to me, and now you're on your own. It was good. It was a good five minutes. Now go figure it out. You're smart. Um, no, he's basically said, this is the way. And if we're able to understand, you now putting on the whole armor of God and then cataloging it, I love something here. And I've taught on this before, but I want you to just think about this. Many times we're told to stand. That means quit moving around, quit trying to do something. 
stand still for a minute, regroup, recollect, reconnoiter in the book for a minute, that all of your feelings and all of your ideas of how to should go out the window in the moment you recognize. Let me ask this question. When was the last time any of you said, I think I'm under spiritual attack? When was the last time you said that? Did anybody ever say that here? I think I'm under, and I've said that. In fact, many times I can see it, and I'll turn to some of the staff people and say, please pray for me, because I can see it as clear as day. I'm not crazy. These are things that could be as, as simple or as complicated as. The devil doesn't care. The goal of the devil, this will change your mindset about how you also view other pastors and ministers. I'm not asking you to have sympathy for someone who's nothing but a lecherous charlatan, but I am asking you to have sympathy. If you look at some of the major ministries, if you study ministry, say, in the last 100 years in America, which is pretty sad, by the way, at least the last 50 years have been pretty sad, but if you study the history, the ecclesiastical history of churches in America, you find that a lot of these ministers, especially the ones that took really big falls or had really big issues, they started their ministries very committed. This is what makes me say, take a time out here. They started off committed. They started off caring more about souls for God and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So what happened? Did they get tired? Did they get bored of God's word? Or did they open the door just a little bit? And I prefer to think that some of these that are still alive today and still going at it, they open the door just a little bit. Some of these are turned over. They're delusional. They believe they're doing something for the kingdom of God all the while fleecing and robbing people or telling them whatever they think are the smoothest, best words that they can say. All the while, no one's learning about this. I really, I, I can just tell you one thing. You may say, I don't I, you know, this is the type of message I... You know, I could live without because I know what to do. No, we all need a refresher. There is a time to be honest with ourselves. I'm honest with myself. I can't remember everything all the time. And as you get older, it only gets worse. <laughs> Cheer up. I need to be reminded. I need to go back and drink and partake of that myself as a reminder that you can get so caught up, you can also get caught up in the doing that you put a halo around the doing, you're not really doing it for God's sake. You're just doing it as a rote exercise. That's what you do. This is what you do on Sunday. You get up, you set your alarm clock, you take your coffee, you, oh, God, got to get dressed, got to get to church, get to church, put your butt in a seat, listen to me, suffer through an hour. Oh, my God, I'm hungry. Okay, it's time to go home. Let's get food. Let's get home. Let's go to bed. Let's start all over again tomorrow, except it'll be go to work, not to church. If that's the way, <laughs> wow. I think I will take up a new vocation. <laughs> I think I can play the bass. Not. My point is, if we are that weak-minded, how can we have any defense toward the devil and the real danger? See, the real danger isn't whether you like me or hate me or whether I have enemies or I have friends. The real danger is the unseen which the Bible talks about. Now, there are, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there that say, well, you know, you might believe in the devil, but that's because, you know, maybe, uh, you know, only those type of people believe in the devil. Let me just tell you something. This whole book, from cover to cover, from the beginning, about the third chapter onwards, is essentially the battle for the soul of man. This whole book, cover to cover, except for the first three chapters and the last three chapters, is the unfolding drama that God said, hey, finally, I will tell you what my plan is. Here's the plan. This is the final plan. My son Jesus Christ will come, and he will make right everything that has been wronged, and he will put back, and there will be a restoration. There will be a reconciliation, which is what is essentially happening when somebody comes, prevenient grace working, to hear, to listen, and to receive the word of God. So what do I want to tell you today? What do I want to say to you today that could, be, uh, change, could change the course of somebody's mindset today? Because that's really the real issue here. People coming and thinking, there is no danger. There is no battle. 
There are people listening to me right now that are listening out of the comfort of their own home, or maybe they're gathered in churches in the home. We have that too. And if not, for the last 24 hours or the last week, even given this any thought, this message is for you. For people that say, well, you know, I, I sometimes think about it, but not, not on a regular basis. This message is for you. If, and I believe this, if the devil has the capacity to pick off people, which I've seen, people will quote the scripture that says, no, no one can take what's in God's hands out of his hands, or the argument is they were never in his hand anyway, that's how they could be picked off. No, sorry, that's not going to be the argument that works with God because the devil tried it with Christ, as I just mentioned. He tried it with Peter. There is a whole host of people in the Bible recorded for us to show us what it looks like when we come to the reality and the knowledge of the information provided versus when we ignore it. I mentioned last week about Demas. Demas preferred the riches of the world versus being at the Apostle Paul's side or being a help to him. Can you imagine, I mean, just think about this, can you imagine if we could rewrite history, if we could go back, find Demas in that particular time, I would have... I'd have shaken him and said, what are you, nuts? The Apostle Paul, you have a chance to be by his side and learn from him. Are you, are you insane? But he says, Demas preferred the world over listening, studying, following a brilliant mind like Paul who was used greatly by God. So a lot of times we have that. I've, I, as I've said, seen it in ministry. Not just, not just workers, not just laborers, but people who cannot understand what the church has become, what we, what we see the church has become, versus what the church was for. Just look around you, and, and if you can find some normalcy. You see, people will talk about the church, and the, the first thing they might ask you if you meet somebody is, well, does your church have a feeding program? Do you feed people? What do you do? Do you clothe the homeless people? See, our, our mindset has been conditioned now by society to make the church into uh, a charity, to make the church into something it's not. The church, the design of the church, it's laid out right there and by the words of Jesus. He told his disciples, go out, make learners, make disciples, teaching men all about Christ. Now, I'm not saying feeding people is bad. I'm not saying clothing people is bad. But Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. Never said anything about establishing the church. Read the day of Pentecost and thereafter, the book of Acts. The people came because they heard a message that drew them in for whatever the reason. I'm going to say it was the Spirit of God. They didn't come thinking, you know, imagine the day of, the day of Pentecost. And people are standing outside and they're listening to the preaching. And here's the conversation that's going on right there in the street. I wonder if they have good music there. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm wondering, will they be serving lunch afterwards, and will it be free? Because these are important things to look for when you're looking for a church in first century Jerusalem, of course. You see how crazy it is? We, we have so skewed the church. We have so skewed commitment. People hear about commitment, they think, this is induced slavery. This is preposterous. But that is the way the church was built. The church was not built by fancy marketing campaigns. I've said this before. If one person would hear me, I'd feel like I won the lotto today. The church was not built on marketing. What, if that's the case, as uh, an individual sitting in front of me said, why didn't Jesus just rent the Colosseum instead of doing the Sermon on the Mount? You know, little muddy mountainside, why didn't he rent the Colosseum? Come here, Jesus preached the sermon that would have been on the mount in the Colosseum. <laughs> and if you stick around, you might just get some free food, a little bit of bread, a little fish. I'm combining some stuff here to make it. You know, people will be drawn in more, right? Free food, music, a little whatever, I don't know. It didn't happen like that. Here's this simple rabbi, preacher, whatever you want to call him, that stands and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, begins to, begins to speak words that are not just simple words, but a recipe for 
or a salve for the soul, for understanding the, the, the big purpose. Why am I here? What does God want of me? And where will I go when I'm done here? Not how will the food be, how will the music be, what, what are the programs, how many services do you have, how many languages do they speak, and uh, oh, here's my other favorite one, the guy that goes to the church that says, we don't, we don't take up an offering, so you never have to worry about giving at our church. Okay, that is ex exactly the antithesis of the Christian message. We are to be givers, giving of the heart, of the mind, of our time, of our pocketbook. So I'm saying to you, the devil can creep in anywhere and attack. It usually, we see this big time in ministry in the commitment. So why did I pick this whole armor of God in Ephesians 6? Not because you haven't heard it before, not because it's something new. I've picked this for some simple reasons. We are to stand that means if you are not sure what to do, you find yourself in crisis, in turmoil. We're talking about your Christian walk. Stay still. Or you want an Old Testament? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Quit trying to solve your own problems or figure out the injustices. This is the other thing that really just bugs me. It's not fair. You ever hear people say that? <laughs> well, friend, you better take that up with somebody else. Nobody said life was going to be fair not fair, it only happens to me, well then good. You can become the poster child for how to and how to not. But look at everything, instead of looking at it as I got the short end of the stick, I haven't been recognized, I, 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 how about God knows my commitment. Don't use that, I had somebody a week or two use that on me, would just Honestly, I was looking for the little brown bag when somebody said, God knows my heart. This is a person who's basically robbed and pilfered or tried to rob and pilfer the ministry for many, many years. God knows my heart. Yeah, you're right, he does. <laughs> and the surprise is on you, not on me. See, the devil does not care. And if I could just, be, if I could just stand here for an hour and just repeat the same thing. The devil doesn't care. He doesn't care if you don't think he exists, then that's even better for him. C.S. Lewis wrote about that in Screw Tape Letters. They don't even give us credit. They don't even know, they're not acknowledging we exist. That, that was the conversation between the rookie demon and the other, and this is the bottom line. Failure to put on the whole armor, which is essentially failure to put on Christ. I'm not itemizing. If, we wanna, if you wanted to itemize it, it comes down to some very simple concepts. God's interested in truth and honesty. We speak the truth in love. He's interested in righteousness, not mine, but his. He's interested in the fact that we creatures need his word, so our feet are prepared for the Christian walk by way of the gospel. We're told to receive the helmet of salvation. Why? This is where supposedly all the thoughts, supposedly, and tough decisions are made, although sometimes I think they're made back there. <laughs> and so what I'm saying to you is it's vitally important that when we say put on the whole armor of God, and I've detailed the armor before, make it a little bit more generic when I say out of Romans what I quoted, to, to put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, essentially, you are covered in him. You hear people saying, covered by the blood. You're covered in him. He's in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And you begin your walk, your day, your challenges by saying, I'm not walking alone. Christ is with me. The temptations that will come my way or come your way. What did Jesus say to the devil or to Satan when he was being tempted? No, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God, every mouth that proceedeth out of the word, out of the mouth of God. It is vitally important for us, if we're going to stand as Christians, we also have to stand in battle as Christians, not as people that, oh, I don't know what to do and I'm scared, but these are the promises I stand on. When the battle comes, when the temptation comes, my Bible says that we are able to withstand. Why? Because God has given us the way he's given us through his word he's given us a doorway when the challenges come when the temptations come he's provided that doorway of escape most of the time we don't take it most of the time we usually go to our own way our own mindset leaning on the flesh instead of stopping stand right there and don't move finally my brethren stand 
stand and don't move for just one second until you can connect with those words that say something to your heart and to mine. The battle is not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. Failure to latch on to just that one point will have you trying to fight in the flesh of the flesh rather than looking at the spiritual realm and saying, greater, that is, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world or in the air about me. And the power that he gives is not superpower, caricature, uh, uh, superman or wonder woman. The power he gives is the power to resist and become what I just said, a place of resistance, not against God, place of resistance against the devil. The devil will try. The devil will keep trying. Maybe you've become strong in certain places in your life, and these are the areas that probably the devil will still try. But he's pretty clever. If he sees that's a fortified area, he goes to the weakest area, and that's the opening he will use. So all I'm saying to you today is for those people who are struggling, for those people who have tried to make a commitment and they've not kept it, for those people who have failed at keeping a commitment. Here, this one's for you. It's okay. The Bible is full of failures. And guess what? I guess if we were all honest, I'm not asking you to raise hands, I'm not putting cameras on, but I guess if we were really honest with ourselves before God, we would all acknowledge we've had a certain failure, we've had a certain lack, we've had times where we have been defeated by the devil and we know it. It's not something where we say, gee, I don't know what happened. You know, you got your butt kicked and it wasn't some random thing. You know who the enemy, you know what happened. The thing is to not sit there and say, well, now I've made such a mess and now I've failed God again. The thing is to get up and you take that first step all over again. You take that first step knowing that God knows he's the one that put all of this into motion. He knows about the enemy of his own. He also knows, we'll call it the antidote or the strength that's needed. And again, failure to appropriate it, failure to reach into the book. Now, let's go back to, let me refer to the individual I, I briefly mentioned when I said I saw this here a couple of weeks ago. It would have been so simple for that one individual. I try to, te I try to make these teachable things to try and help somebody else. So they don't have to go through that same misery. It might be something else you go through. But, but it would have been so much better for that individual instead of trying to tell me God knows their heart and they're doing such good things and they're so pious and they're so righteous and everything they've done has been only with a heart to help. Open your mouth and just say this one thing. I really messed up. And I'm not trying to con God. You know what's amazing? When we just open our mouth and talk to God and simple things, you know, stained glass, special words, oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Father, heavenly, did glass tone. God, I really messed up big time. You gave me a chance and I blew it. This is the way I talk to God. Now, I need to ask God for forgiveness and another chance. Now, the, the crazy thing about God is he never says no. He wants to see the right spirit. And he'll, he's able to set you back on your feet and give you the courage and the strength and the fortitude and the wisdom through his word to start all over again and maybe learn from the last time. Not say, I'll never do that again, but recognize a little bit like Jacob. This, this little limp I have here, I can tell you what this injury is from. I know exactly what it's from. And I'm very grateful that I have this, which was Jacob's issue. God crippled him, and he never forgot it, but God also changed his name. I'm not trying to tell you that your failure to commit is something, oh, God's never going to forgive, but your compliance with the devil and your giving in so quickly. The question is, if it's such an honor to serve God and to do something for God, then my thinking is there might come a day where God will say, you know, this is the 5,000th time I've tried with her, and I'm kind of done. Now, I don't know. I think God maybe has unlimited, but I'm not wanting to test out the theory of what the limits of possibly what God's version of unlimited is. In other words, you don't need to have that many um, bleep-ups 
to know when it's not right with God. And my heart today says, if I can help somebody and focus them back to the word and say, listen, we all have moments of weakness. We all have the time of temptation and the time of trouble. We all have something that we deal with, that we wrestle with, that we want to pierce through. There's only one way to do it. It's in God's strength, through his help, through his spirit. And for those people, and specifically I'll say for the one or two that have uh, been attacked by the devil in their commitment, I, don't, I, I look at those people and I think to myself, could they even open their eyes and recognize what they have let pass them by that opportunity may or may not come again. Time for you to get up, dust yourself off. Yes, you messed up. Get up, quit thinking about what you didn't do and get up and start walking again with God. And that's the only way. God is, as I said, God knows. If, I, if there could be a screen that drops over my head and says, this is Melissa Scott's, uh, you know, so many mess ups. Mine would have probably six or seven digits on it across the way of how many, my, the mess ups of my lifetime. God says, I know you're going to be a mess up, or I know you will, or I know you have, but that's not my focus. My focus is, and not that you succumb to the devil. God's not going to say, I don't want you anymore because you succumb. It's coming to your senses and recognizing God is not your enemy. See who the real enemy is and recognize the battle for the soul requires you to put on the whole armor of God, and whether it is for a commitment work to the church or a commitment to God in your personal life, in your personal devotions, you make that commitment recognizing that commitment will make you a target. But don't worry. If you're looking to God, God also knows how to take care of you and protect you, but you must stand on the word that says, having done all, I put on the whole armor of God, having done all, I will stand. And Lord, I trust you above any force, any instructions, any guide, to see me through, and I know you'll see me through in spite of whatever comes my way. The promise to me and the promise to you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That promise is as good as the day he spoke it until the last day, the last day of your breath on this earth. So stand with that and take knowledge and comfort that God wants you to be valiant in the fight, and he's given us the tools to do it, to stay committed in spite of the devil's attack. I hope that somebody in the sound of my voice has been encouraged. And if you haven't been encouraged today, at least know that I've given you the wake up that you have a nice neon sign on your back that says, yes, you. And you'll know what to do when that neon sign is being looked at by the enemy saying, oh, that's a fine sign. We haven't seen that one before. Let's go after that one. You rebuke the devil he flees from you. That is God's promise, and that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.